Dear Sirs, one very cold day just over ten years ago, I found myself standing alone at a windswept train station in Newcastle. My being there was thanks to a letter from a complete stranger. I didn't know it at the time, but this letter and the short walk I was about to take would cha soon change my life forever. My name is Robin Bennett and I'm the founder of a translation bureau called Corto Translations in London. And the letter I received a week previously invited me to Newcastle in order to view three large volumes that appear to be in an unknown tongue. A very generous fee for my time was offered, plus a lot more money if I was able to identify and subsequently translate the strange writing. The letterhead itself bore the name Tyne Antiquarian and Rare Books and gave a residential address but no phone number and it ended with the initials A-G-F-P. The lack of a full name at the end of the letter and the general air of mystery about the whole business meant that when I arrived in the right street I was very much looking forward to the interview with A-G-F-P and to seeing the volumes themselves. The entrance to the nondescript house was half hidden in an alcove whose door seemed to have been shut several years previously and not open since for any reason. I pushed through the poppies that seemed to be thriving in the otherwise bare front garden and looked for a buzzer in vain. Then I gave the door a tentative knock, followed, on reflection, by a good kick. Inside I heard an odd noise as something shuffled across the bare wooden boards. I leaned closer to the door to locate the source of the noise, but as I peered into the grubby stained glass window panel, some primitive instinct suddenly told me to be fearful. Nothing at first stirred within, and all I saw was the blurry outline of shelves and boxes and books. However, some indefinable sense of danger made the hairs on the back of my neck rise, and I gave an involuntary shudder. I was just about to pull away from the murky view I had of this old room with its lurking presence, when something moved, right in front of my eyes. The figure was small, no larger than a few centimetres from head to toe, and it seemed to hover in front of my face. Just then, whatever it was moved closer, and for the briefest of instants I had a very clear view of a pair of small but exceptionally piercing blue eyes that bored into mine. Almost as soon as the connection between me and it was made, then it was severed as the creature flicked away from my view and was gone. Now, since I turned into the street, there had been no sign of life anywhere, so I was startled when I heard a loud sniff that appeared to come from my left leg. I turned this way and that and eventually identified the source of the sniff as being a small boy standing just behind me. Hello, I said, and turned to resume my assault on the door. When I was interrupted, he's not here. Who's not here? I asked Midthwack. Mr. Fancy Pants. Mr. Who? I asked instinctively. Go away, I added. The boy didn't seem at all put out. Mr. Arnold G. Fancy Pants. That's what me ma'am calls him anyway. I think his name is Foul something Palmer, but like I said, he's not here. Right initials, I thought. Where is he then? I asked. He's dead. They carry him out on a, in a box on Sunday. He was that old. Oh, I said, I see. I ran my hand through my hair. Does anyone else live here? The boy chewed his lip for a bit. He used to have a cat, he said eventually, but I ain't seen it for ages. Thank you, I said, feeling irrationally cross that Mr Arnold GFP uh, died and didn't tell me about it. However, there was nothing for it but a short walk back to the station and to catch the next train to London. So I looked with mixed feelings at the closed door noticing for the first time it had the outline of a cup carved onto the int into the wood. Then I gave the small boy 50 pence, a short lecture on personal hygiene, and I went home. Three weeks later, there was a further turn to these mysterious events when a bulky package arrived from a firm of solicitors in Sunderland. Their client, Mr Arnold Falez Palmer, had left recent instructions that in the event of his death, which, given the weather in the north of England at that time of year, was most likely imminent, the three volumes enclosed to be sent to me for language identification. The books were in poor condition and unlikely to be worth much, but any proceeds from the sale should be given to his niece and sole heir, Ms Natalie Falaise of Lille, Northern France. The books, when I unwrapped them, were certainly antiquarian looking, as far as I could tell. Nevertheless, as the solicitors pointed out, they seem to have been ill-treated over the years and they may well have been fairly new, just beaten up. The blunt the binding looked like it had been done in someone's kitchen using a cheap glue and a blunt knife, and the pages were dog-eared and contained an array of stains, some of which, on closer scrutiny, looked suspiciously like dried blood. 
As for the language, it looked familiar, but at first glance I hadn't a clue as to its origins, except to say it was probably Indo-European in root. This didn't help me much. Nearly everything is Indo-European in root. However, nothing I looked up and none of the translators I asked seemed to be able to make any meaning in the sentences, even if some of the words looked strangely familiar. I eventually concluded that it was most probably written in some sort of private code. I sat down to write Ms. Natalie Fallaire's a letter explaining the background to the books, her uncle's stipulation in his will, and my opinion as to the origin, and most probably limited value of the books. I suggested that, as a blood relation, it would probably be better if she took it upon herself to sell the books. If she made some money out of it, then I would be grateful for a small fee for an hour or two's work. If not, then no matter. I added that I had not own, known her uncle, but I was very sorry all the same for her loss. A few weeks later, I received a reply from Ms. Falaise in perfect English. She started by thanking me for my letter and suggested that we meet at the Eurostar exit in Waterloo Station that weekend, where she was getting a connecting train to visit old university friends in Exeter. As to the value of the book, she begged to differ with me. Her uncle, whom she had only met a few times in as many years, had spoken of them on a number of occasions and had strongly hinted that their value was far greater than anything he had acquired in his long career as a rare book dealer. This time, at least, there was a phone number on the letter, and I rang to confirm with her. That job done, I went to put the books back in the packaging. Now, I was just reflecting on what a sweet, vivacious girl she sounded on the phone when a sheet of paper half fell out, and it caught my eye. I instantly recognised the handwriting as that of my late correspondent, Mr Arnold Fancy Pants. On it, he had simply written, GK, LTN, Arom. Given the context, I presume that the first two were his shorthand for Greek and Latin, and whilst I wasn't sure what a Rom actually was, I was pretty confident that it was simply his abbreviation for another language. Looking it up in Dalby's Dictionary of Languages, 1990 edition, it confirmed that it was more probably a Romanian, a dialect of Greek spoken in, north, in the North Country and a root and relative neighbour of modern Transylvanian. When I met Natalie at the pub in the station, she was blonde, very pretty, and unreasonably cheerful, considering she'd been stuck on a train for nearly four hours. But before long, we were getting on very well. In a nearby pub by the river, I fished out the books and showed them to her, and I also gave her Uncle Arnold's short handwritten note. She tucked her hair behind the back of her ear, stared at the paper for a few moments, and then thumbed the volumes. Meanwhile, I was quite happy to drink my beer and enjoy studying her in profile. When she looked up, she smiled almost apologetically and said, I'm sure you've thought of this already, but could the writing not simply be a mixture of all three? And there you have it. I knew immediately that firstly she was almost certainly right, and secondly, if I wasn't already, I would very soon fall in love with Ms Natalie Falaise of Lille, Northern France. In fact, we were married in the spring of 1997. Since then, on and off, the business and children allowing, I've worked on the translation. At first it was hard going, but the initial successes and growing fascination with the actual contents kept me going. The writing is indeed an odd mixture of all three languages, and after some time I realised that the writer was just lazy, and that they simply used whichever word and whatever language came to mind first. The volumes told the explosive and moving story of an intelligent species, no larger than the forefinger you are using to hold down this page, that has lived amongst us, largely in secrets, for thousands of years. These creatures are very close to the best of us in so many ways, in their language, good humour, courage and sense of fairness, but utterly different in others, such as their inhuman turn, in turn of speed and grace, their obsession with blood and most importantly their gift for magic. They go by many names, Nosferatu, Vicolecus, Strigoi, however these days we simply know them as vampire. Small vampire is a name all of my own. They ref never refer to themselves in this way. They do not actually see themselves as small, rather that we humans are lumbering, ungainly and ridiculously big. Another title for these stories might have been Vampires the Truth, or The Secret History of the Hidden Kingdom, but I'm calling it simply Small Vampires because it is catchier and because it describes them in a way that at least, le least partly explains why so human few humans have met one. It also explains why so many of us stoutly believe that vampires only exist in books, films and in the imagination of people who find the idea of knowing someone who bites them on the neck romantic. A small vampire is actually the size of a dragonfly. They travel widely, and you've almost certainly seen several, and indeed been bitten by one or two right in your back garden. 
You most probably thought that it was a mosquito or a horsefly, then forgot about the bite because it didn't itch or go red. But if you look carefully at the bite, you'd have seen not one pinprick bite mark, but two. This is important. The two holes represent one for each of the sharp little teeth of the small vampire. If you happen to catch one, which is unlikely given their skill at magic and how fast they can move, and if you looked at him or her under a magnifying glass, you would see that they had dragonfly-like wings that fold neatly away behind his back, and, if he's not wearing his usual light armour, you would see soft, mole-like fur um, covering his body. This velvet fur is mostly black, but with a flash of white around the neck and where his tummy starts. The effect is as if they're wearing a perfectly tailored evening suit. Even more striking are their faces, which are basically human in a way that's hard to explain. Under a very strong magnifying glass, girl or duchess vampires are nearly all very beautiful, and the boys elegant and charming, with a hint of just something proud and rather dangerous about them. Apart from the si their size, it is important to know that vampires are most certainly not the wicked creatures of the night with foreign accents that Hollywood would have us believe. However, they are steeped in magic, and like any other creature from the Hidden Kingdom, they are probably much cleverer than any of us. How they came into being is lost to us, but what is almost certain is that they have been here from the start. The first volume you have here starts nearly 2,000 years ago, when civilised humans were just uh, beginning, mostly unaware, even then, of the existence of these small but immensely powerful creatures.